This evening, I hope to shed some insights on the imagery associated with the life and martyrdom of St. Sebastian, who is as important in modern and contemporary gay hagiography as he is in Catholic. We know only the essential elements of his life, but it is the legend as much as what passes as facts that have secured him a place in the pantheon that includes Mae West. Judy Garland, James Dean, and Jasper Johns. It is the representation of this man, this Sebastian, and his martyrdom that have intrigued artists, <clears throat> that have intrigued artists, um, and his ottoman, art, martyrdom that have intrigued artists as well, who I contend find in his story, and particularly in his death, resonance with their own feelings and desires. And also with their faith. <clears throat> but first, we need to know Sebastian's story, perhaps first elaborated by Ambrose of Milan, who lived from 339 to 337, 397 of the Common Era. In the sermon number 20 on Psalm 118, Ambrose averred that Sebastian was Milanese and already venerated locally and in Rome in the fourth century. Jean Bolon, the 17th century scholar of all saint-related legend and arcane, attributes the Acta Sanctorum for Saint Sebastian <clears throat> and to Ambrose. Jacobus, Jacobus de Voragine in 1275 had earlier compiled the lives of the saints in the Legenda Aurea or Golden Legend. According to both in the third century of the Common Era, Diocletian, the emperor of Rome, appointed Sebastian, who was born circa 256 and educated in Milan, to a capitalcy in the emperor's corps of personal Praetorian guards. Sebastian was obstinate in his refusal to obey the order from the emperor to renounce Christianity and to refrain from proselytizing throughout the city, specifically to the men under his command as well as to the twins, Marcus and Marcellianos, who, though of noble birth, converted, refused to perform or witness sacrifice to the Roman pantheon of gods and goddesses, and were imprisoned. Sebastian encouraged the two young men to refrain, re, to remain steadfast in their beliefs, and therefore he was tied to a tree. <clears throat> and I'll show you El Greco. He was tied to a tree where archers shot him full of arrows. He did not, however, succumb. And Irene, who became a saint in her own right, rescued the moribund Sebastian, extracted the arrows, and cleaned his wounds. In circa 288, at approximately age 34, strikingly close to the age of Jesus of Nazareth. Nazareth's age at the time of his own martyrdom. The revived Sebastian held court at Irene's house and continued to preach and to convert, even to cure, and miraculously, for example, if only by his aura, he cured the mute Zoe, wife of Nicostratus. Unable to keep his own self quiet, however, he stood on a step and harangued his former boss, the emperor Diocletian, for his pagan practices as he passed by in a litter. This time, the enraged emperor had the twice-martyred Sebastian cudgeled to death at the Hippodrome and his body thrown into a privy and thus into the Cloaca Maxima, from whence his spirit spoke to a Christian widow. Again, according to some accounts, the sainted Irene and to, in others to the blessed Lucina, and told her where to find his undefiled body and to bury it in the catacombs by the apostles. His remains subsequently and supposedly moved to the current day San Sebastiano Fuori del Mura in Rome, supposedly on the site of his flagellation and bludgeoning. Thus, after Peter and Paul, Sebastian became the third patron saint of the city of Rome, as well as the patron of soldiers, archers, and athletes, and a protector against plague. Sebastian's feast days are January the 20th for Catholics 
and December the 16th for the Orthodox faiths. Among the prayers said in his name is one from Ambrose, where he is identified as, quote, dear commander of the Roman emperor's court, and which identifies his athletic body as proving too strong for weak arrows. Quote, may athletes be always as strong in their faith as their patron saint has clearly been. Sebastian, as we shall see, mutates over the centuries from a proselytizing warrior to a sweet, pious youth whose legend, or in Shakespeare's words, alters as it alteration finds. In our own age, he has been reconfigured at times an achingly lovely catamite and in the hands of others a slightly rough trade. Part of the mystery of his cult, whether for the traditional believer or for the gay aesthete, is in the mystery of his life, and just so, as if to satisfy a need to disguise or righteous, make a righteous claim to Sebastian as the cult figure for an international cadre of gay followers. A new interpretation of his life and death has appeared in the literature, primarily through bloggers, one of whom has an entire site dedicated to the rebellious saint. Reading between the lines of the stories of his life and even of, his pr of this prayer, later commentary, or more accurately, an interpretation of legend as gossip, has Sebastian as the favorite or even the lover of the emperor Diocletian, who becomes incensed when his bodyguard scorns the imperial infatuation by preferring a more celestial one. Rather disingenuously, if you ask me, such interpreters see this harangue of the emperor on Irene's step as a coming out of sorts and an admission of his true identity as a Christian, even though he will be subjected to persecution. The earliest representation of Sebastian in the visual arts seems to be mosaics in Ravenna and Rome that date from the fifth through late seventh centuries. Interestingly, one from the latter period in San Pietro and Vincoli imagines no callow youth but a bearded man in court dress without attributes of arrows and bindings. In the 11th and 12th centuries, even though the legend of the second martyrdom had become church doctrine, artists and craftsmen, under the spell of the more romantic aspects of Sebastian's life and death, chose to depict arrows and archers over Orger and the sewer. In the cult of this early Christian martyr, the church found a symbol, an emblem even, of bravery, bravery in defense of the church. A man who suffers death for his faith in the 13th and 14th century in the hands of such artists as Bar Barnaba of Bodna and Piero della Francesca, the arrows of pain and pestilence war and illness are understood and portrayed as a constant assault on the human condition. Sebastian became the plague-weary populace, saint of choice in Western Europe as a vision of health with a strong, youthful body. Some 16th century commentators decried the emphasis on his beauty, believing probably rightly that the emphasis on the flesh betrayed the aspirations of the spirit. Not all artists had followed the fashion of representing a youth, sticking instead to what was to believed to be the more accurate description of the saint as an experienced, grizzled soldier rather than a winsome, dreamy youth. In particular, northern artists such as Durer bound a muscular, bearded, Hercules of a saint to a tree, while his contemporary Martin Schongauer preferred to portray Sebastian as a post teen with billowing loin cloths, loin coverings that allowed the artist to show off his virtuoso drawing skills. As to be expected, another of Durer's contemporaries, Matthias Grunewald, in the Eisenheim, Eisenheim altarpiece, 
suitably draped a mature, bearded Saint Sebastian who seems to have wearily and at great effort escaped the bonds on the column behind. Lucas Van Laden's, sorry, Lucas Van Laden's portrait of the saint lies somewhere between, but a particular note is the realistic addition of pubic hair sprinkled above the rather shocking loincloth come codpiece. We can compare these works with one by Titian, which is, of course, an Italian artist from Venice. And you see, in this case, Titian has represented him as an elderly man. But in this one, which is a painting by Titian uh, that's in the Hermitage uh, that the Russians have put on a stamp, uh, which I find sort of ironic. Um, the ravages of plague in the 14th century guaranteed Sebastian's stature and cult as an exemplum of mankind. <clears throat> and centuries later, after the worst of the scourge was perceived as over, church and lay people attributed its abatement to the intercession of the Virgin, to St. Rook, later in the 15th century, and of course, to St. Sebastian, the incorruptible who began to appear in representations of the Madonna of the Mis Misericordia as the divine recipient of the arrows otherwise repelled by the Virgin's outstretched mantle. Several sources, in fact, use the metaphor of the arrow as the deliverer of clay. In the medieval period, <clears throat> excuse me, in the medieval period, as well as into the Renaissance, Sebastian's popularity among artists, probably because of his status along with St. Roque, as intercessor against sickness and pestilence, grew significantly with the contemporaneous spread of the pandemic, beginning around 1094 and continuing through the horrendous black deaths of the mid to late 14th century. Giovanni del Biondo represented the saint as being so shot through with the arrows of play that he as he is identified in the scene surrounding the central panel of an altarpiece <clears throat> reflecting his martyrdom that he was said by some, referring to an earlier description by a Roman writer, that it was he resembles, he had so many arrows that he resembled the hedgehog. At the end of that century, the Sienese artist Tadeo di Bartolo painted a saint identifiable as Sebastian through the attribute of the arrow and a style that looked backward at a time when other artists anticipated the new approaches and perspectives and the concurrent interpretations of the human figure of what is now known as the High Renaissance, the era of Botticelli, of Leonardo and Michelangelo, all dark artists, by the way, identified at one time or another as homosexual or proto-gay, if you will, at one time or another. In theory, in the queer theory, in fact, uh, and I show you Perugino's meltingly beautiful image of Saint Sebastian, and note the classical background emphasizes Greek sources for uh, even for the body of Sebastian. Also in this and others of the Renaissance, notice the covering uh, of, uh, Saints, of Sebastian's genitalia, uh, because you, often it is used to, to uh, emphasize uh, that part of his humanity. Uh, again, we're back at Tadeo de Bartolo, and I wanted you to note that in the 14th century, Note that this is, he's frontal, he's flat in a flatten, and he is depicted against a gold background. So consequently, unlike in the uh, Renaissance, he is not, there's no attempt to picture him in real space. This style, however, one that even Giotto and Duccio had begun to modify over a century earlier, began to pause with the discoveries and practice of such artists as Masaccio and Donatello, the latter apparently another of our men-loving forebears, as they, along with their contemporaries in Northern Europe, 
put realistic figures in real space and eschewed the frontal and the flattened for the classical and the volumetric. Thus, along with the Neoplatonism of Marsilio Ficino, came a resurgence of interest in Hellenism and the Greek ideals of masculine beauty. A paltritude dependent on the musculature of the athlete, such as our soldier, Sebastian, and from which sprang a new meaning. And I'll show you Rubens. As the writer Emmanuel Cooper explains, quote, the perfect male form was considered the mirror of the soul, close quote, with the male nude in art, quote, as close to sexual neutrality as the human body could achieve, possessing noble proportions, ideal muscle formation, fine skin quality, well-modeled facial features, and strong, alert posture, close quote. Ancient descriptions of Sebastian, therefore, as a soldier, heart of body, and his status as a plague site made him particularly attractive as subject, but one that had to be rejuvenated. <clears throat> or made youthful again in the mid 15th century as a man, sometimes an ephebe of extraordinary sexuality and a throwback to an, he an Hellenic ideal. Like his rough contemporaries, Roger Van, ba Van Bad and Piero della Francesca, who began to emphasize the humanity of Sebastian as well as his sanctity in the early Renaissance, circa 1459. The Paduan artist, Mantegna, painted the first of his three pictures of Saint Sebastian as a particularly interesting subject. This painting by him is emblematic of the high Renaissance fascination with classical imagery, such as the broken architecture, to which Sebastian is bound. Note the inscription in Greek on the column, the organization of the pictorial space through an acute understanding of the advances in linear perspective, and then the exaggerated, almost feminine aspect of the saint's posture, his musculature and his ecstatic swoon, if you will. For reference to the interest in this subject's <clears throat> emotional psychology, Montaigne had to look no further than the nearby Capella Scrovani, where the divine Giotto described in paint the exquisite tenderness of uxorial love, as well as the unbearable agony of grief for the dead. Just so Montaigne's Sebastian gazes sadly, but almost coyly at heaven, even though one pesky arrow pierces his body from neck through forehead. The saint's pose is a kind of elegant contortion, a hips long contraposto that would be the envy of a 21st century runway model. Certainly the loincloth is more decorous and substantial. Michele Marini's, <clears throat> this work by Michele Marini had a similar pose for his Saint Sebastian in a concurrent statue in Rome, Santa Maria Sopra Minerva. The Spanish version, the very tie of the red, red cloth, suggests the phallus behind. And in Lorenzo Lotto's lubricious version of 1531, the cloth with its elaborate knots barely contained the burgeoning virility of this robust golden youth. Some present day historians view the adoption of Sebastian as gay icon only through a 19th century lens. I would argue perhaps along with the previously cited Cooper that even proto-gay Dossi found in the subject of Sebastian as 
found in the subject of, Tabas uh, of Sebastian, as well as in the post Michelangelesque body of Christ, um, in the figures of Michael the Archangel and the well beloved and always blonde Saint John the Evangelist, and of course in images of Ganymede, Bacchus, Narcissus, and Adonis, expressions of desire, artistic self representations, if you will, that are as valid to discuss in the Renaissance and before as they are in the 21st century. Angels, though sexless, and Putti gave such artists as Sadler the opportunity to contrast the saints' mature masculinity with their infantile charm as they untie him from the tree. The writer Michael Alexander noted in the International Journal of Sexology that nothing affects the artist's work in a more direct way than sex. It affects practically every aspect of art. <clears throat> May it be productive or reproductive art. In other words, and I'll show you the allegory. go. I didn't show you the Sadler, I'll show you there. Note the Putti celebration and also the uh, contortion of his body. And then that's the El Greco. Uh, oh yeah. In other words, the El Greco and the naked allure of Sebastian in that painting and in so many of El Greco's works we're discussing is a manifestation of the artist's implicit or explicit desire. Certainly depictions of Saint Sebastian <clears throat> as a beardless youth of the throes of ecstatic experience, according to Vasari, were, nay are, excuses for the display of masculine beauty. And in James Fenton's words, an object of desire, a lure, if you will, a temptation, where Richard Kay describes as a decadent par excellence for his miraculous survival of an execution by arrows, not only represented the transcendence of nature's and violent laws. It provided a sublime image of erotic and stoic surrender to pain. Such an artist, one whose art portrays his sexuality, was Giovanni Antonio Bazzi, who by living from 1477 till 1549, spanned two centuries of 15th century high Renaissance innovation to 16th century mannerist exaggerated posturing, such as again, El Greco. One commentator noted that Bazzi was unwilling to keep his, quote, agonizing torment quiet while trying to reconcile homosexual proclivities with religiosity, close quote. In fact, Vasari tells us that Bazzi earned his nickname Il Sodoma, or the Sodom Sodomite, by consorting openly and apparently unashamedly with, quote, an entourage of foppish boys, straight-laced in this instance, the acerbic Bazari calls Bazzi licentious and dishonorable in his dealings with boys of whom he was inordinately proud. Bazzi took to the sobriquet Sodoma with pride, urging his boys to chant the name when one of the, his horses won a race. And here's a painting by El Sodoma. While the rest of the world in the background goes its own way, Il Sodoma's saint awaits the crown of martyrdom, brought by the androgyne angel who emerges from the celestial light. Il Sodoma represents and presents a sturdy Sebastian, but one tinged with melancholy and sweetness, trademarks of his style, particularly beautiful, I believe, in the painting is the saint's impressive neck, almost another branch of the tree to which he is bound. And you note that that continues to be copied. Uh, this is uh, from the cover of Stern magazine. Uh, and actually, uh, Il Sodoma's uh, version of the image of Saint Sebastian has become an icon of his own. In Yukio Mishima's novel, Confessions of a Mask, which I hope you've all read, the 12-year-old protagonist becomes so aroused 
by the sight of a photograph of Guido Rani's Saint Sebastian from the Palazzo Rosso uh, in Genoa that he swoons, thus beginning years of self-abuse described by Mashima literally as prologue to murder, to cannibalism, and even to necrophilia. Most commentators believe the novel to be autobiographical. Uh, and years later, in 1970, Kishin Shinoyama photographed the robust, very male writer as Guido's, Guido Rani's Sebastian. The same year that Mishima disemboweled himself in ritual seppuku for failing in a bizarre, slightly key, keystone cops coup attempt. Similarly, Fra Bartolomeo's 15th century altarpiece for San Marco, according to Vasari, contains such beautiful and rapturous images of Sebastian that women had to confess that they had sinned at the sight of it. <clears throat> and thus, it was removed and sold. But back to Rene, to Guido Reni's Baroque vision of Sebastian, the one in Genoa, showing the winsome youth bound and gazing heaven, his genitalia barely covered by the twisted dra drapery <clears throat> that mimics the contortion of his body. And Charles Darwin's modern description, a saint with a twinkie torso. And Sebastian Melmoth, Sebastian Melmoth is Oscar Wines pseudonym while he was in French exile. In his description of how he came to write a sonnet on Keats' death, he explained his rationale for comparing the dead poet to a martyred saint. Quote, as I stood beside the mean grave of this divine boy, I thought of him as a priest of beauty, slain before his time. And the vision of Guido Saint Sebastian came before my eyes as I saw him in Genoa, <clears throat> a lovely brown boy with crisp clustering hair and red lips, bound by his evil enemies to a tree, and though pierced by arrows, raising his eyes with divine impassioned gaze toward the eternal beauty of the opening heavens. Charles Kingsley describes his protagonist as experiencing an onslaught of tears from viewing the almost naked saint, an awakening from the constraints of Puritanism and an understanding that love can lead to madness to death even. Guido Rini's life as written by his biographer, Carlo Cesare Malvasia, may provide clues to the single-minded devotion to the subject evident in the two of the six paintings said to be by him. This one is, of course, the one in Genoa, and, and this one is in Australia, and another one in Dulwich, in the Dulwich uh, picture gallery, and the one of the six paintings said to be directly by his hand entirely. The artist lived with his mother until he was 55 years old, and the sight of the female models was said to turn him to marble. When his mother died, he refused to allow women in his house, and in a strange little biographical note, did not allow a woman's laundry to touch his own. Here's in Rome, and then his version that is in Madrid, which we saw recently. Um, these are tantalizing details about his life, but without clear evidence of the artist's sexual leanings, and we have very few. If we look to his paintings, however, we see an artist obsessed with the purity of his subject, the fragile, almost feminized gaze from an otherwise very male body, a pure suffering that Susan Sontag has noted as a curious divorce of beauty and pain, with his visage rarely showing the vestiges of agony. Thomas Mann, is it Paris? in Puerto Rico, and here's the Simon Vouet on Saint Sebastian. Thomas Mann, Thomas Mann called it grace and suffering. That is the symbolism conveyed by Saint Sebastian, 
while others, particularly in the 19th century, hinted or expressed outright that such ecstasy was equal parts sex and spirituality, as in this Caravagesque image of the saint with the come hither look. Later in the 17th century, two artists represented in the exhibition currently at this museum gave us high Baroque images of Saint Sebastian. In one, he is tended by Saint Irene, and we should digress for a minute to relay a little of her legend, since she becomes more important as the essential L.A.M. mercenary <clears throat> element as she reappears in the pictorial history of the changing images of Sebastian from the century. Her chief attribute, of course, is her sucker of Sebastian, but she was also the wife of another saint, Juan Castellas, also central to the story of the twin martyrs who counted earlier. Irene herself was martyred in the year 288. In the glorious painting, which you see before you, by <clears throat> Hendrik Ter Bergen in 1625, with its brilliant orchestration of color and light, Sebastian's body seems to glow with a near-death pallor, while a brighter, more natural light plays over the face of the saintly Irene, who gazes sweetly at the arrows she tenderly extracts from the saint, swooning in her arms. The artist who studied Caravaggio's works in Rome may have painted the work for a hospital in Utrecht, where a seven-year epidemic plagued the city. This painting appeared in an exhibition at the Natural, National Gallery in Washington, D.C. several years ago, where a curator characterized Irene as, quote, a Christian exemplar of benevolence and virtue given to compassion and piety as her ministrations to Sebastian. Just so, she again appears as an early model of Christian charity in Felice Ficarelli's Saint Sebastian in that gallery, two galleries over, tended by Saint Irene in the current exhibition. Irene's gaze is one of compassionate determination on the arrows she so delicately, so carefully, so elegantly extracts from his, Sebastian's arm. In her saturated blue brown, she and the seductively clad saint emerge from the gloom of a darkened room where he lounges almost decorously on the white bed. It is as if he is at spiritual repose, calling to mind Felice's nickname, Il Reposo, for the artist's supposed lassitude. Sebastian, even ignoring the good woman's gentle caress of his soldier, looks heavenward for strength with eyes so big as to appear exophthalmic the better to emphasize the innocent sweetness of his expression, a marked contrast with the languorous display of his body, his bee-strung lips, if you will, and barouged cheek. He exhibits the lissom body of an adolescent, his skin rosy and unblemished, except by the punctures red by blood. Compare that work to another work by the same master, Cleopatra, with the same lips and same caress of her nipple, etc. In the same exhibition is Adorio's Marinari's depiction of Saint Sebastian as a curly-haired youth holding the palm of martyrdom, as well as its implementation, the arrow. Again, he appears just past puberty, a post-adolescent of more than passing loveliness, with his head slightly cocked he gives rapt regard to the divinity and in pointing at himself, softly strokes his cheek. His counterpart, Apollo, who has a more than passing resemblance to Marinari's Judith, which I don't have a slide of, sorry, um, stares straight at the viewer. Haloed like Sebastian, he is bathed in the aurora of his dominion, the sun while holding the lyre he invented symbolic of his status as god of music. The 19th century avocations of Saint Sebastian have been neatly characterized by Richard Kay as belonging to one of three categories. The first of which is Sebastian as, quote, oblique emblem of erotic emancipation, 
a paradoxical figure of passive yet triumphant ecstasy, at once submissive and resplendent, close quote. As in this work by Friedrich Overbeck. Such a figure is the gorgeous youth in Friedrich Overbeck's painting in Berlin of a downcast Sebastian tied to a tumescent phallic column that seems both to support and to sustain him in his quiet agony. A second Victorian formulation, in part a reaction to the first set of responses, accentuated a Christian martyr or warrior of manly individualistic temperament, um, self-assured rather than inhibited, even self-effacing in his martyrdom. As in Puvi de Chavannes, image of Sebastian's execution. Third and the latter part of the century, Sebastiano became a powerful visual metaphor for decadence, a man who could induce, if not exactly represent, otherwise unsanctioned homoerotic yearnings. I'll show you a work by Moreau. One who engages the viewer in a direct, unabashedly sexual encounter, such as Moreau's painting of a youth so svelte as you will notice, a youth so svelte that his girdle is less a covering than a pictorial device. And as a transition to the 20th century, Odilon Rudon, true to his position as a father of symbolism, gives us an allegorical image of the solitude of martyrdom, a bound sight, alone, without angels, without putti, without holy women, without fellow soldiers to accompany him into death. In the 20th century, St. Sebastian is not only eroticized as in the Poles Stanislav Jokovic's woodcut of 1946, but increasingly politicized as in Fuch, Ernest Fuchs' memorial, memorial work for Mahatma Gandhi a surrealistic vision of torture, pain, and the pernicious madness of violence. And you all know who that is. Uh, I don't care if you are 19 years old. Uh, Muhammad Ali's passion as a conscientious objector earned him the cover of Esquire as a Sebastian in Everlast boxing trunks. Some of these images are astonishing, I find, in their beauty. This is my bonkel, and it's a kind of reveling in the male form, but also in a tenebrous uh, atmosphere that gives it added mystery. Um, so it's a kind of reveling in the male form that is once arousing and with the approaching storm, somewhat disturbing. Oscar, I'm sorry. Oscar Magnon gives us what could be a still, a movie still, with Sebastian's in the arms of a manservant, perhaps who clutches manfully one arrow while an almost disguised Saint Irene reaches more decorously for another. In true late 20th century, even 21st century, even yesterday, um, with an emphasis on fashion as mode, style, look, or attitude, Pierre and Gilles. Pierre and Gilles make their comely young Sebastian into almost plasticized mannequins, hinting perhaps at the sterility of their sexuality. That's of the Bardenum. Others are equally provocative of different emotions. Arthur Tress's photograph of the nude man in the burned out surround both attracts and repels, as do many of these contemporary images. Artists identify strongly in this period with Sebastian, such as we have already seen with Mishima or with Aegon Sheila's, sorry, or with Aegon Sheila's self portrait of Sebastian, or with Keith Haring's <clears throat> creature, who seems to be punctured by airplanes, a motif, perhaps the inspiration 
of a sadly prognosticated sculpture by Michael Richards, which is in the North Carolina Museum of Art, that's called Tar Baby versus Saint Sebastian. Tar Baby versus Saint Sebastian, which is an image of a black airman also beset by airplanes and a premonition of the sad fate of the artist himself who died at an extremely young age in the Twin Towers. There's a show of his of the Bronx that I just opened this weekend. In the 21st century, we begin to again have artists in various disciplines who want to incarnate the beauty of Sebastian's legacy. Um, with the human, unabashedly sexual allure. You see a work by uh, Marek Koshala. Sebastiano is beset by forks in another uh, manifestation of the uses to which his legend and image are put. And in this, by Niels Osthorst, uh, he is emblazoned with the Red Cross he becomes another infant of Prague, one with baby doll sweetness and innocence that makes the arrow through its neck all the more heart-tugging. Conan's tribulations at the hands of NBC are satirized in an image where his false smile suggests not only his role as comedian, but also his rejection of his treatment. Both Frida Kahlo and Louise Bourgeois found in Sebastian, Sebastian's plight resonance for their concerns. In Kalo's case, an artist who had literally been impaled by a steel rod in a streetcar accident, Sebastian's power as an avatar was from the similar violation to her body, a piercing of the pudenda that produced physical agony, nearly killed her, and through the rest of her life, she was met with psychological distress. Not so Louise Bourgeois. And if you'll notice, Saint Sebastian is put into the feminine in this case. Louise Bourgeois, however, in her evoc evocation of the saint, fashions a contemporary Venus of Willendorf, one made of pink fluff, armless, with one arrow in her groin, a woman who, in the artist's own words, runs away from terror, unlike the man, Sebastian, who runs toward it, along with his pagan doppelganger, Apollo. A journalist named Daniel A. Kushner in the Dallas Voice made the queer ultra cool in his review of Damien Hirst's exhibition at the Goss Michael Foundation. He dwelt at some length in an otherwise short review on St. Sebastian's exquisite pain as he describes Damien Hirst's work. Yeah, not pleasant. A 10 foot tall glass container, chamber filled with formaldehyde solution that contains the body of a black calf. Perhaps a work to which Hearst thought bovine-centric Texans would relate. The writer continues in noting that the furry little cat is attached to a steel beam pierced by dozens of arrows that Hearst supposedly shot himself with a crossbow and that the calf's face The calf's suffering at placid expression is emblematic of martyrdom. It's gruesome, it's sad, and it's powerfully alluring. The reactions to the preview of this work in Dallas were telling and sarcastic. Kenny Goss unveiled St. Sebastian during the preview shindig for the annual two by two for the AIDS and art gala. That means the gallery space was filled with a bunch of gay and gay-friendly Dallas socialites. Most of them grabbed their pearls in horror, and some rudely mocked it right in front of Goss. George Michael, who happened to be there, reportedly bought St. Sebastian for $7 million. At the reception, Goss explained that St. Sebastian 
that his calf could be described as an evidence of intense suffering. The short overview of the various representations of Saint Bat Sebastian leaves us at a juncture symbolic of the ambiguity, perhaps, with which our subject has been betrayed since his martyrdom. It is a tale of pictorial tension, certainly contrast between youth and maturity, between spirituality and sensuality, between license and restraint, and between torture and beatitude. One may rightfully ask if the latter images of Sebastian, and by those I mean from the 15th century forward, are representative of Christian devotion and piety, or of desire, or gay identity, or of both. That the image of Saint Sebastian has been exoticized is beyond doubt, as we have seen in various representations through the ages, but most assuredly is what Kay describes as the pictures of a beautiful boy man who is beatifically ecstatic even as he is penetrated by the arrows of outrageous fortune, those that afflict us all and those that assure him an abiding cult in the age of AIDS, COVID, and a new kind of despair. Yet whereas he was a 14th century synecdoche of suffering mankind, he is a latter-day exemplar of erotic longing one whose pain is exultant even as it is deadly, one who is splendid in his suffering or for some 19th century women, such as Anna Jameson, Anna Jameson was a uh, art historian of the late 19th century, um, for her images of Saint Sebastian were, were, were like enduring a torture that is emasculating, feminizing, and yet alluring. In the physical portrait of this bound position at the tree and the beauty of his tor torso, invariably he is represented as pliant to God, yielding in both body and spirit, again, a dangerous contradiction in which artists tried to eroticize without being overtly Christ explicit, a Christian hero. He is a poster boy for sadomasochists. A remarkable for the virulence of the associated images rather than for the veracity of their description. After all, there are those who see the church itself as a religious torture chamber, dependent on punishment and reward to elicit meritorious behavior. Most explicit as interpretation is Richard, Richard, excuse me, Rachel Taylor's observation that, quote, all art is thrilled with exquisite ambiguities. Is it God or angel? Is it virgin or boy? Is it Eros or Saint Sebastian? Or is our fascination for the sexualized Saint Sebastian as unanalyzable as John Addington Simon found in the 19th century when writers began to notice the almost idolatrous sexuality of the saint by such artists as we have seen? It is my contention that at least from the 15th century and possibly as early as the 19th century, artists began to see the beauty in Sebastian's tragedy, so much so that by the 16th century, he has become the tragic beauty because remember Michelangelo said that perfection of art is in the male body. Um, and that was well known. Uh, he has become the uh, tragic beauty and ultimately in the 17th century, an emblem of blissful receptivity, as Kay describes it. And after the 19th century, an evocation of surrender to pain, to the slings and arrows of a fortune so outrageous as to revisit us with our own epochs, pestilence, and for which we need our own strikingly, stoically suffering Saint Sebastian, who like so many of us is both victim and survivor. We have not even touched tonight on the literary focus of Sebastian, who turns up in Oscar Wilde's picture of Dorian Gray, in Thomas Mann's Death in Venice, as well as notably in Tennessee Williams' Sunday Last Summer, where the unfulfilled poet named after the saint, Sebastian Venable, shares the saint's fate 
only in the case of Tennessee Williams, they're not arrows. They are black birds who bite Sebastian Venable to death. As Travis Deal in a review just last week observed, prompted by Michael Richards' show in the Bronx, with martyrdom, with martyrdom <clears throat> comes a kind of religious ecstasy. It's hard to ignore the erotic subtext of Saint Sebastian as transmuted through Western art history. I'll show you the Spanish version, Fernando Llanos. Um, as we have seen for centuries, and this is Zaganelli, um, as we have seen Sebastian's limp suffering image run through with long arrows, has that offered an opportunity for painters to revel in the male form, and equally for the faithful to find a kind of comfort, comfort in depictions of his, St. Sebastian's, stubborn resistance to winged torture, the preamble, the preamble to his sanctity. Thank you. And did you want me to ask?